So um, I am going to introduce our, our first speaker, who we are just so happy to have. He is, in fact, I found him because he's the author of the textbook we use in the history department here. I don't know that. But uh, well, food, in a food ways in world history is uh, when I looked up, we have a, a fairly new class in the history department on food ways. And, and uh, I looked, I thought, what are they using? You know, I have all the old classes. And they're using food and world history. It's out on the table, and it's Jeffrey's book among many books, with many articles. And he's obviously been working very hard on food ways for Ohio. He's really a, um, an expert in the field. We're extremely lucky to have him. He's, um, he is, was a, a professor at the, uh, at the University of Minnesota, but he has just moved to the University of Toronto. I'm saying that right? Um, and, um, well, he teaches food and world history. And uh, he uh, is the, just a couple of the, the titles of his uh, rather extensive uh, um, uh, list of publications on food. My favorite is the one he's uh, the frontier, Planet Topic. Planet Topic of Global History of Mexican Food. And I, I went to a uh, university in England before, and I've got to tell you that as a Californian, <laughs> I got over there, and I thought England, I was such an Anglophile, and about three months, it was like, there's no Mexican food here. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> it was really hard. I had no idea that it wasn't, um, you know, back in the ice age when I was an uh, undergraduate, that it wasn't, in fact, um, it hadn't moved anywhere. The globe may have been moving to it. <laughs> you know, the pieces were moving. They weren't being put together. So um, let us bring him up, and he will introduce us to the topic. And I can't think of a better person to do it. OK, great. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I actually, I've been teaching, uh, I taught my first history of food class 20 years ago in 1994. And the interest in uh, food as a subject has, has just, it's, it's amazing how it's grown and how we've recognized that something that was so fundamental that it just been overlooked uh, and just sort of seen as, you know, we eat three times a day. And so, you know, we don't really think about it. Uh, whereas in many societies, because that those three meals are not so certain, maybe they do actually think about it a lot more. Um, so I'm really delighted to be, uh, to be with this. I've actually done several of these uh, teaching workshops. I, I, I led one on food and world history about, I don't know, five years ago, and, and it was just a really exciting time. And so I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. And um, so I have to tell you, though, I'm actually not going to lecture. I figure with a title like Food, the Ultimate Active Learning Tool, if I just stood here and lectured for an hour, it'd be kind of, kind of, I don't know if hypocrisy is the right word, but certainly it would somehow be inappropriate. So I, I thought I instead uh, what I would do is to, to try to, to, to create more of a discussion and, and to, to sort of work things in. And I think that as an introduction to the field, that may actually be a very helpful one. In fact, the uh, uh, Michelle's sort of just in asking you, uh, where does food fit into your own teaching? That's exactly what I was going to do, but that's okay because you've already got a start. So that's fabulous. So um, anyway, this is a whole institute. You're going to be spending three days talking about why food is important and 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 how we should be teaching with food and and and. And so I don't want to sort of presume to say there's any one answer. Everybody has their own answers, and and we could spend the entire time, you know, just kind of going over that. But. Um, to sort of structure this discussion, what I'd like to do is suggest that there are uh, three ways that we can think about food in the classroom. And one of them is as a lens, right? Using food uh, to think about other topics. Okay. Uh, another way we can uh, do this is as a topic in itself, right? That we we teach about food as something that is important for students to learn and engage with, and and that rather than you know sort of being a means for discovering some other important question, that it, it is actually is the important question that we need to be studying. And then finally, as a uh, material. All 
side. And here is where I'm thinking of it as an active <laughs> learning tool. And incidentally, the title of this and this sort of uh, way of, 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 of structuring it comes from an article by uh, Jeff Miller and John Deutsch called Teaching with Food. And it was uh, published in the Oxford Handbook of Food History. And, um, and so I'm, I'm kind of relying on their way of approaching this topic. And, uh, and, and, and the ultimate active learning tool was, was also their little phrase. So let me just kind of give uh, credit to where it belongs. And um, what I'm going to do to try to provide a little more continuity is, is as we go through this discussion, try to draw things back to the Columbian Exchange as a topic whenever possible. And partly that's because I'm a Latin, or I started as a Latin American historian before I started moving into more broadly world history, although, uh, and, and actually, uh, uh, Alfred Crosby, the person who coined the, 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 the term the Columbian Exchange, who really got us thinking about it, uh, was himself a Latin American historian. And, and actually, if you read the book carefully, you'll see that he knows a lot more about Latin American history than he does about, about world history. But it, it, it's less important, the details, than the big conceptual framework that he had. And I think I think that's what's really uh, so, so big about that book. And, 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 and it's why, it's, it's really one of the places where Latin American history most directly uh, works its way into US history and, and world history. It's that moment that Latin America had, you know, is sort of on the world stage, at least as we, we tend to teach it now. Um, and it's also, I find, an area that still is just deeply fascinating to students that, you know, I mean, they still, after we've been teaching Crosby, the book was published back in 1972, and students are still astounded to find that the potato did not come from Ireland. <laughs> um, and that, you know, the tomato was not from uh, Italy and, and, and so on. And so it just, it, it's, it's one of those things that, that, that they really kind of grip on in a visceral way. And I think that's because it's about food. Right, that there's something about food that just grips you, and I definitely talk about that a little more. Okay, so anyway, uh, we've got uh, an hour or so, and so what I want to do is just spend uh, about 20 minutes or so on each of these three topics, and kind of uh, work with you about thinking these things, rather than me telling you what what I think about them. Uh, you know, sort of see what are. And so let me start just with the question of food as a lens, right? And I want to suggest actually that food can pretty much tell us something about anything. It's amazing how fundamental it is to our lives. So rather than start with food, let me instead start with some of the big questions that you uh, look at or try to convey in your classrooms um, that, that have nothing to do with food. But I mean, when you're teaching, whatever it is you're teaching, you know, be it uh, world history or um, mathematics or whatever, what are some of the, the big themes? that you try to convey, that at the end of the year, school year, if students have learned something about X, that you feel like, OK, I've, I've, I've accomplished something. Yes? Just the question of who are you? OK, so can we call that identity? Yes, exactly. Others? Yes. Systems. Systems. Okay. Systems okay. So can can I just put the environment then as yeah. a sort of
reasons why you should know that or whatever, but there are certain things that you can see that in themselves denote such complexity that you can imagine there must be something embroidered around them. And so I think identifying those markers, I don't know quite how to say that. Yeah, no, I think, I think civilization is, is some sense of a broader unity that brings together and that has you know, both a geographical span but also a historical span that links us to something deep in the past. So yeah, I think civilization is a, a very... Good one. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like identity, but the question of how, how I come to be here. You know, we're in California and you have, you know, 40% of the kids from China and, you know, whatever. And so, how do I happen to be standing in this place at this time? You know, that's one that I think is deeply important. And yet, when you first said it, I thought, okay, are we talking cosmology? Yeah. How did I arrive here in the sort of the. the <laughs> Or, but we're talking about, but, but, but so, I, you know, that, that could be a sort of a study of immigration history, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's yeah, talk about it as, as immigration. Um, you know, in some ways, maybe rather than immigration, you know, maybe, because we, in the United States, we're, we're a country of immigrants, and we have this very fixed narrative about what immigration is, and and that tends to leave some people out, right? African slaves weren't immigrants because they were carried over you know, as cargo. Uh, Native American peoples weren't immigrants. And so rather than use the phrase immigration, which kind of you know, kicks in a set of ideas, what if I, we just say peopling, right? The peopling of the Americas or of the world. Because that actually is a very big history uh, that um, maybe doesn't, that, that, that gets us beyond some of our own parochial notions of what, of, of how we got here. Or, yeah, we'll just say peopling. There's actually a movement to create a uh, uh, um, a museum in Washington, D.C. on the peopling of America. Um, how did law develop? Okay, so, um, yeah, law. Um, power. 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 Okay, good. Yeah. I think of world transformation. Okay. Um, the transformation that comes on when you exchange foods or any other goods at certain points in history. Okay. So, you know, actually transformation, I mean, that, that's a very big thing. But in a way, uh, I mean, I, I, I think of that as, as, as what, what history means to me. I mean, I think of history as change over time. And, and, and then that's really what we as historians are trying to understand. And so let me just, can I just write history and, and just uh, take that to mean historical change, but then also continuity, right? Because you can't sort of understand one side of it without kind of, so just, I'll just write history. Good. It's a historian, I'm glad. Yes. Going along with people, I'm, I'm thinking of settlements, both in ancient history and, and everywhere. Um, you know, food determined where people settled. Why did they settle near the river? You look at you know ancient Egypt. Why did they all settle along the Nile? You know, and then you can get into transportation later. Yeah, on, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. How did they transport? Yeah, and actually, I mean, I, I that I think that sort of fits into this category, and maybe we can just sort of divide it up on. The one hand, it's settlement. You know, on the other hand, it's mobility. Right? It's about you know, continuing to move around. Yeah. Well, my maybe is for a repeat, but how uh, children seem to be interested in the response to all of these things. Like, you know, if you have something and it's in a hot climate, how do the people respond to how to preserve something or how to? grow something, or how did this develop? How did the corn develop? How, so development of crop or food or 
more than just what was there, how did they put it there? Yeah, the yeah, so sort of the economy, if yes. you will. Yeah. Okay, just a couple more. Yes? Yeah. Um, the 21st century issues is um, where the food's coming from. Like it was growing here, but it's going somewhere to be cleaned or canned, and then it's brought back. Yeah, and can I call that globalization? Within the country, too? Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, well, we could, we could also call that, if you want to sort of focus on uh, commodity chains, would be another way of, of, of looking at particular things. But I think that, that that's certainly so. I so. wanted to link it up with uh, nutrition and health issues, because labeling all right, well, let's just go, go ahead and say commodities as, I mean, the commodus, right, the original of commodity is just something that's useful, right, and how does it get to us? One last. Um, I'm going to use this because we can't hear very well. The biggest theme I incorporate in my classes is the idea that history is a narrative constructed from fragmentary evidence from multiple perspectives. Excellent, yeah, so uh, how do we know what is, you know, what, what knowledge we have, you know? I mean, what is our, you know, epistemology? What is our, our, the sources of that knowledge, right? So that, excellent. All right, so, you know, we could go all day, but let me just uh, kind of go through this list then and, um, maybe just, you know, for one minute or two minutes, very briefly, just kind of in a nutshell, you know, how could you create a lesson plan that made food a part of these kinds of things, right? So um, just to start with identity, you know, one way you could do that, actually a very popular form of um, assignment, uh, certainly in college classrooms, but also perhaps in, in, in other places as well, is what's been called an autoethnography. In other words, sort of studying yourself, right? Ethnography is when you go into a situation and you kind of look around and you sort of view the activities that are going on. An autoethnography of Thanksgiving, right? You know, what big festival foods do you have, how do you behave, and all those kinds of things. And what better way than through a festival and through the foods that you consume in a festival than uh, to sort of to think about, you know, who you are and, you know, kind of what your traditions are, you know, your citizenship, all of these notions. Uh, and, and how those differ, you know, as you kind of go around your own classroom, you know, and see how those, those traditions of celebration are, are different from one place to the other, right? And so I think that, that and, and identities are so complicated and they're so multifaceted, right? Um, this sense, and, and they're, they're situational, right? You know, you're, you're one person when you're hanging out with your buddies, you're somebody else when you're talking to, you know, your parents or whatever, right? And so to get a sense of the complexity of those identities, you know, just offering your, asking your students to sort of write about an event that's very important to them. Um, and, and actually, uh, you can, uh, there's, there's a wonderful article by Corey Norman, who's a religious studies uh, scholar, that looks actually at cosmologies, right? You know, that cosmologies, right, you know, the, 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 the apple in the Garden of Eden, right? You know, these, these foods that are so central to our religious notions of who we are and orient us, right? That, that sort of looking for those stories in foods that people eat, whether they be sacred, you know, a Thanksgiving with your grandma, or profane, a run to McDonald's, right? You know, and, and so really getting at the identi at, at identities through those kinds of situations, um, through what's been called the food voice. The food voice is a term that's been used by uh, Annie Hawk Lawson. And the idea behind it 
is that people who might be very reticent to talk about some subject, uh, who might, you know, the, the ones that, I mean, you know, when we all have them, who are just kind of withdrawn in class, that, you know, you, you try to draw them out, oftentimes are willing to talk about food when they may not be able to talk, they might, may not be eager to talk about many other subjects. And, and, and part of the reason for that is, of course, that, that food is so central, right? That, that um, but it's also that they have a sense of authority. That is something they know, right? When they may feel like they're being left out, they feel like they're not getting, you know, many things in class. Maybe it's because of linguistic troubles. They're not as, as you know, comfortable in the classroom. But when it's on a topic that relates to them, and that they can perhaps teach the other students something. You know, in our family, we do this. This is, this is us, right? And the food voice is a very powerful way uh, that scholars have found uh, to, 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 you know, kind of draw out information from communities uh, who are maybe marginalized, women, minorities, and others, right? But it's also a very powerful way of of in the classroom, of, of getting students to, to, to speak out, to, to make them feel more comfortable. And, so, and, and we can see in many of those, uh, those things, like, the, that, like that, that uh, description of, of Thanksgiving, right? You know, that's the food voice talking. And, and there's so many other examples of that. And so tapping into your inner food voice and getting the students to do the same can be a very powerful way uh, of, of, you know, sort of, uh, creating uh, a discussion in the classroom. Okay, so that was a little longer than I thought, but anyway, um, I, I think it's important. I think, you know, so many parts of, of what we're trying to teach are ultimately, you know, about who we are, you know, and, and some of the things like, you know, gender or class or race or all of those other things, right, that, that, that define us in so many ways, right? Um, that, that, that food can be a powerful way of drawing those out, of defining those concepts. Okay, um, the environment. Well, <laughs> you know, what could be more basic connection between humans and the world that we live in than the food? Because, of course, it's, you know, we, we take it from the environment and we, we put it into ourselves and it becomes <laughs> us, right? We are what we eat, that sort of hackneyed phrase, but one that still is important and worth thinking about, pondering. Um, so, uh, you know, what are some of the ways in which we can uh, sort of use uh, um, uh, food as a way of understanding um, the environment? Uh, one of the, actually, when I teach my, my, my world history class of food, I um, really have started making the environment one of, you know, the basic themes of the class. Um, I use the environment and I use uh, commodity chains. And, and I talk about um, sort of uh, cultural ecologies, right, which is sort of how humans relate with the environment, but then how we think about it, right? The culture is the meaning we assign to it. Right, and so, you know, if we think about, uh, you know, what is our place in the world? Are we, you know, here to uh, kind of think of it as, as, as dominating, you know, of just taking all the resources we want? Or is it a, a sense that, you know, we have to give something back, right? You know, that, that there's kind of these closed systems and you can't endlessly take out without, you know, kind of replenishing those kinds of things. And so, you know, if we uh, sort of look at the environment and, and, you know, we can do this over the long kind of, I mean, in the really big historical frame, right? So somebody was talking earlier about the Neolithic Revolution, you know? Uh, what's the difference between hunter-gatherer ecologies and agrarian ecologies, you know, the ways that, you know, uh, mobile communities, you know, that would just harvest the, the natural resources, and farmers who, who more intensively cultivate the land, right? 
And then in turn, we can sort of see the transitions between the, uh, the agrarian societies and the modern industrial ones, right? Where we in, you know, cultivate even more intensively. Okay, um, and so um, you know, looking at the big historical picture, right, uh, and these these cultural ecologies, I think can be a, a very uh, useful way of 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 thinking about it, and and making us confront the fact that our notions of you know, the meanings of our rea relationships with the world, with the ecology, uh, has a big bearing on, you know, our own success, right? Uh, the sustainability of societies. So, um, so yeah, I think the environment uh, can be, um, uh, you know, certainly can be, you know, food is a place where, where where we can, you know, profitably examine the environment. Um, I mean, civilization, right? You know, uh, when we think about uh, what are the elements of civilization, right? You know, I mean, there are um, sort of some elements that are uh, like the law, right? A common legal framework that governs our our. Um, um, our behavior, you know, relationships between other people in society. Uh, there's language. Um, there's, um, oh, I don't know, other ones. But I mean, certainly food is one of those basic civilizational concepts that really defines and separates, you know, one group of people from another. Yeah. I was thinking of like terraces and roads and irrigation, like evidence of physical evidence of human cooperation. That's, I mean, like. Well, yeah, I mean, that certainly is an element. And, and you know, we can kind of see those in the archaeological record, right, the development. And, and even going back to, you know, domestication of particular staple foods that then come to define us, right? So, for example, in um, Mesoamerica, right, Mexico and Central America, right, I mean, to this day, many people say we are the people of corn, right, that maize was the foundation of their society. They worshipped corn gods. Uh, the foods that they ate, I mean, corn was just, you know, I mean, it was in every meal. It was, some people have estimated that as high as 70% of the diet in some, you know, places was corn, right? It's so foundational. And, and every society has its own version of that, right? You know, in Europe, I mean, wheat was the preferred grain, okay? And to sort of see the significance of that um, in, in Catholic uh, um, theology and doctrine, okay, only wheat can be used as, as the Eucharist, right? As the body of Christ. You can't use barley or smelt or corn or rice or anything else. You know, Jesus is wheat. And when the, the, when the conquistador, no, I'm serious. When, when the conquistadors came to America, they tried to stamp out corn, right, which was associated with these native gods and, and get the people to raise wheat instead. And, and that was seen as being part of that evangelical process. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the very deep, uh, you know, and, and, and it's just a sense of what foods are proper, you know. So, for example, in Europe to this day, people think that corn is something you feed to pigs, right? That, that human beings don't eat corn. Uh, even Mexican restaurants in Europe, they have wheat tortillas. They don't have corn tortillas. It's amazing. Uh, and so, you know, we can kind of go through any of these topics, right, and find examples. Yes? Could you link uh, managing global warming? Uh, oh. Topic of uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and I mean, in, in multiple ways, right? So uh, one thing when we think about what the consequences of global warming are, right? So just to sort of give a little a little big history here, okay? So uh, the Neolithic Revolution, which was arguably the first big change in how humans lived, okay? 
happened right at the moment, right at the dawn of what's called the Holocene period, okay, 10,000, 11,000 years ago. Um, the climate went from an ice age climate to a mild, stable climate, okay? People had actually tried farming before that, and it didn't work because the climate kept changing, okay? And it just, it wiped out their crops, and, and they, they, they ju it just didn't work. Uh, when the Holocene came along, when this, this, this new climate stage came along, agriculture took off everywhere. Okay, so they used to think there was just a couple of places where agriculture, where people invented agriculture and, and, and then they, they kind of took it everywhere else. But, but when, as, as we've actually expanded out the archaeological record to sort of look at all these places, what they found is everywhere these kinds of experiments happened and it was only when it actually became possible to farm, right? It's only when the ecological conditions of the Holocene took place. Now, so agriculture for the past 10,000 or so years has flourished under a particular climatic system, right? And I mean, we go up and down, you know, there was the little ice age of the 17th century, but people are now saying that we are entering a new geological period. It's where the Holocene is coming to an end and the Anthropocene, the human caused climate is beginning, okay? And we don't actually know what's going to happen in that. Uh, but the question is, can we continue an agriculture-based world, human civilizations based on agriculture in a climate that is not, you know, fundamentally fitted to agriculture? And so, you know, if we want to talk about what the future of humans and, and humans having something to eat at least, you know, in, in, this, in the ways that we now think of it, then we have to, to ask, you know, is climate change going to make that impossible, right? So, so you know, I mean, that is just one of those existential questions that, that really faces us right now. Well, and I was thinking that one thing that could really tie all those together would be studying famine. And you could do it through time, too, because I was thinking specifically when I taught English 3 and did Grapes of Wrath, it ties almost all those things together. And then you can talk about the potato famine, and it ties almost all those things together. And then you can look at you know, contemporary culture, too, in Africa and subcontinent and things like that. And that you can make those connections between particularly English language arts and social studies in a really positive way, too. Oh, yeah. And I mean, one thing to keep in mind in looking at famine is that the way we behave in times of, of shortage is really in some ways a carryover from the way we behave in other times, right? That we have all of this. And so our notions of who goes hungry and who doesn't are, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they tend to be the people who, who suffer worst are the ones who are most marginalized already during times when things are good. And so we can see, you know, uh, famine and plenty as two sides of the same coin. And, and, and you know, I mean, the, the use of, of, of Grapes of Wrath, a wonderful, I mean, any fictional novel, any fictional work, you know, can be read as, you know, as, as, as a document on its times that tells us so much about so many different aspects of, and, you know, and so it kind of becomes a question of, of how do you choose those uh, tools, right? And then how do you think about those sources, right? How do you question, you know, what they tell us and what we can read from them, right? Uh, and, and I think that, 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 that fiction is, is a wonderful way of getting at questions like, you know, the, the, like hunger and the social relationships around hunger, you know, and, and the way we eat in normal times and how that structures what happens when things fall apart? Yes. I was also thinking of the topic of locally fishing and how the environment is changing fishing, but also how what we do is changing the fishing, damming up the river, salmon. I mean, you know, we can, we can do a real... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, and, and you can go so deeply into any of these topics, but I've got to move on. So, 
let us now move from using food as a lens, and actually I gotta tell you guys cheated, because you know, a lot of the topics you picked were like cherry picked. I was hoping you would give me really hard ones, you know, that would be very difficult to relate to food, but, but you just kinda you know, threw me the softball, but that's okay. Now, what I wanna do is move to food as a topic, and just you know, kinda very briefly, and you've already started giving some examples of foods as topics you know, that, that are important to, um, to, to discussing. And uh, so let me just, there were, there were three of them you mentioned, and one, the first one was something like, what was it? One was nutrition. Yeah, nutrition, excellent. Yeah, and scarcity. scarcity. A farming. Other sort of, let's maybe, you know, kind of, well, uh, I mean, you know, other types, like the Columbian Exchange, right? Oh, yeah, the Silk Road, right? So the Asian version of the Colombian Exchange, right? Cross-cultural exchange. Uh, yeah. Maybe this is too. Uh, I think maybe the word I'm looking for here is aesthetics mm. associated with food. Yeah. Maybe that's, yes. right. that's great. Actually, very interesting research being done on aesthetics and, and food, yeah. Technology. I'm sorry? The technology of food. Yeah, the technology. Right, and, and, and to sort of, and I kind of wanted to make this sort of more concrete, right? So maybe it think about like industry. I'm sorry, what? Did, technology in, in terms of food distribution. Okay, yeah, so um, let's see, so. Uh, And I'll, I'm just going to put sort of industrial technology because I think that, I mean, obviously you've got distribution, you know, and carts and, you know, carrying people carrying things on their back before the industrial world. But, but uh, just because I think the industrial revolution is a topic, you know, that, that you know, industrial food is, is, is an important one. Yes? Food preparation. Okay. So, um, Any others? Yeah. I'm thinking of the politics of the, for example, with, uh, with banana, the United Fruit Company, yeah. and, and the, how that influenced and control of uh, our politics and training into the control of the politics of the I have a whole banana day in my Latin American history class, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you want to see one? Genetic altering of food. Yeah, GM foods. Okay, so I filled up my space here. So, um, and so yeah, there's there's lots of. One, oh yes. The minimum wage debate is so big. Restaurant industry. Oh yeah, and labor, yeah. right? Restaurant labor. Yes, labor is huge, and it so often gets ignored because, of course, what is the industrial sort of corporate approach to food if it's not to hide the labor away, right? They're making it easy for you. Yes? Eating seasonal and local food. Oh, yeah, seasonal and local. And one more to somebody, yes? How about the contribution of women, since women have had so much to do with production, uh, food, and Growing food and subsistence economy. Um. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to try to then 
take some of the, I want to talk about a couple of, 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 of topics, and again, sort of related to the Columbian Exchange, and try to draw in a lot of the themes that you've had there. So again, I, I, I said I would do a little bit on the Columbian Exchange, and of course, it's, it's one of those big, you know, as Crosby pointed out all these years ago, it, it's one of those moments when the whole world changes, right? And um, Crosby really was looking at it as, from a demographic perspective, okay, right? Uh, when the Europeans came to the Americas, they brought with them disease uh, that, together with the act of conquest, uh, resulted in this, this catastrophic dying of the native populations. And, you know, demographers debate just how catastrophic it was, but certainly, you know, there, there are very few uh, um, instances where, where so many people have been killed so rapidly as, as the conquest of the Americas. Right? Um, and yet, when you look at the other side, what you see is that in the centuries following the, um, the, the Columbus's voyages, the populations of Europe and Asia shoot up in a particularly dramatic fashion. And Crosby, uh, not the first person to suggest this, but he is kind of does bring it together in, in, in an interesting way, points out that these highly productive American crops, corn, potatoes uh, in particular, um, fill in gaps in the uh, agricultural systems of the old world uh, that allow dramatic population growth. Um, and, and so Europe and, and Asia, I mean, if you just kind of look at the demographics, it's, it's striking, right? The, the Native American population does this, and the European and, 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 and Asian population does that, and then the African population is just kind of flat, right? And that in itself is kind of an interesting question. Why does the African population just kind of... Because they have nothing to exchange. No, that's actually, I, 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 I'm not sure that's the full answer. Um, because, uh, in fact, Africa is, is, is a big part in the transatlantic economy that develops after 1492. Um, but they take place in that economy in a particular fashion. Hmm? Yeah, right. So basically what happens is, is that all over the old world, population is increasing. But African population is actually being diverted somewhere else, right? That the, that the slave trade then is taking, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 or even more million people, right? You know, who could have contributed to the economy of Africa uh, and, and taking them away, right? So undercutting that, right? And so, so the, there's a demographic side to that. And if you read Crosby, um, he tends to focus on, um, you know, just those, those, those demographic consequences. But there are questions that we can ask uh, that, that will sort of help us to, to move along and that will um, perhaps focus less on the conquistadors and on the European merchants and perhaps bring us into questions of gendered labor and of, um, of food preparation. Um, and so one question then that comes up is, is why did these foods get taken in some particular places? Okay. Uh, and Crosby's answer to that is, well, the, they, they, they fit ecologically. Right, you know, so uh, potatoes tend to grow in cold climates, right? Corn, you can't grow too far north, okay? And so in those climates, those places where, where foods were adopted, they were adopted because they were ecologically appropriate. And obviously that's true, right? You're not going to plant a new crop, okay? But did the crops plant themselves? Did they, you know, did the corn plants just kind of march out into the fields and say, I'm putting down roots here? No, somebody had to plant them. Somebody had to decide, right? And, and we've already seen, right, that Europeans tended to look down their nose at corn, right? To not, to not plant it. So why were and who were the Europeans who were doing it? 
And it turns out that they were marginalized people. And in particular, they were people living in marginal lands. Okay? And, and this is actually one of the most remarkable things about corn that we in the United States totally don't get because we tend to plant corn in flat Midwestern fields, right? You know, in Iowa, where, and then, I mean, you know, corn grows very well there. But corn actually has one characteristic that is remarkable to somebody coming from the, the Midwest. And that is, corn will grow on those terraced fields, that it will actually grow on a mountainside. And anybody who's gone to a place like Mexico or Peru and seen them growing corn on a mountainside, it just boggles the mind. And so what happened was that corn tended to be planted in those marginal places uh, where before, I mean, basically there was just kind of pastoralism. You know, people would run their sheep through these hilly lands or goats or whatever. And once that started to arrive, they cut down those, those um, um, uh, trees and started planting corn instead, which had, of course, ecological consequences. Um, but it also had nutritional consequences, right? As these marginal people came to rely on corn, okay, um, well, first the question is, how did they cook it? Okay. Did they make tortillas and tamales and other Mexican foods? No, why didn't they make tortillas? You have to didn't know to soak it in water. Exactly. They didn't know how to make it. And they didn't know how to make it because that was a form of gendered food preparation. Okay? A thousand years ago, women in Mesoamerica found that if you soak corn in a mineral lime, okay, calcium oxide, uh, and it can be many kinds, it can be just a sort of a mineral, actual, you know, carbon kind of, uh, or it can be just the ashes from a wood. That was actually how the, the Woodlands Indians did it, the Mississippians did it. Um, but that causes a complex chemical transformation which releases vitamins contained within the corn and allows the body to use it, okay? If you eat a very high corn diet, you know, like 60, 70 percent of the diet is corn, and you don't do this cooking technique, it will actually make you very sick. It's pellagra. It's a disease that eventually causes death. Okay? And, and, and it became widespread in parts of Europe because they didn't have that gendered knowledge, right? That women's cooking skills. Because, of course, the corn was carried by men, but they didn't bring the Indian women to teach them how to cook it, right? Uh, and so when we look at the consequences of the Columbian Exchange, we have to uh, think about the... Um, uh, you know, sort of not just, you know, where the plants go, but how they are used, right? And what the technologies are, and, and you know, think about these in gendered terms, right? Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, th th that's certainly one important consequence of the Columbian Exchange uh, that, you know, goes far beyond just the map of where the plants go, but then brings it into social systems, right? And has, you know, nutritional consequences, and it's also tied into scarcity, right? It t the corn, as a lower class food, tends to go to the people who are hungriest, and, you know, it's, it's, it's nutrition, it's something they can eat, but it may lead to other problems. It may lead to uh, you know, sickness in, in that case, right? And so this is about farming, it's about cultural exchange, it's about, you know, lots of different topics, right? And so as we start to unpack the Columbian Exchange, you know, moving past Crosby's, you know, highly original formulation, we, we start to, to encounter many new forms of questions that are, are deeply important, that, that have to be asked, right? And that's as true for researchers as it is in the classroom, uh, as a way of, you know, getting students 
to, to sort of think about questions um, you know, beyond just that, that sort of big picture, but then also to focus in on, on those local social relationships that are so vital for understanding you know, those basic questions that we were talking about before, like identity or like power, right? Who controls things? Yes? When you're talking about porn and the Columbia Exchange, I have a question that probably pre predates them, and I was running this during research, because corn is one of the three sisters of the Native American, as well as all Amer uh, indigenous people in the Americas. So has there been any research as to the spread of corn and squash and beans? Yeah, and, and actually one of the things that, 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 that comes out of that is interesting new combinations, right? So one of the basics of, of sort of, uh, of, 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 of civilizational basics are combinations, okay, that, that peasant farmers tend to eat a basically vegetarian diet, right? Because they, you know, they can't afford, right? You know, you can just grow more food if it's plant food than if it's animals grazing on it, right? I mean, uh, hunter-gatherers could hunt because their populations were very small. As agricultural societies' populations rise, they're reduced to a vegetarian diet. And so they find combinations of plants that allow them to, you know, that, that heighten that nutritional value. And so, for example, corn actually has very uh, poor um, uh, protein. I mean, it's got protein, but it's missing amino acids. But by combining it with beans, you know, legumes add in and they complement, they create a complementary uh, um, protein that actually creates a healthy diet, right? And all around the world, we see examples of complementary um, vegetarian diets, right? And so um, in Asia, it's, it's rice and soy. Okay, in, um, uh, in, in, in the Mediterranean, it's um, uh, uh, wheat and broad beans or lentils or, um, you know, so, so those legumes then are part of it. Now, what happens with the Colombian Exchange and the Silk Road and all of these forms of, and even contemporary global, you know, globalization is those, those things tend to mix. Right? And, but they, they tend to create new forms of complementary ones, uh, complementary vegetarian diets, you know, so, so that you know, when people discover new ways of putting things together. And so, for example, in the Caribbean, a lot of people eat rice, an old world product, together with beans, a new world one. Right? Um, by the same token, uh, when corn went into Asia, Right, it went into, uh, and it, again, it tended to go in, into places like the Himalayas, right, mountainous areas where other plants didn't grow, and they started growing and and um, and, and started growing corn. But then they mixed it with the local pulses, right, soy in Asia, in South East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, mixed it with you know dal, uh, the the local versions, right, of of those things, and so new combinations tend to be created. And, and, and again, it's, it's, it's that inventiveness of the kitchen, right? Everybody who goes into the kitchen, even if we get out the Betty Crocker cookbook and follow the things, we're always changing things a little bit, even if it's only inadvertently. I mean, people have said that the first and most important scientific laboratory was the kitchen. It's where people first started to discover chemical reactions and use it in ways that were beneficial to, 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 to life, to make things better, right? And so the invention of what's called nixtamal, of that, that chemical combination in, um, in, 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 uh, uh, in, 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 in the Americas, right? In the Mississippians, in Mesoamerica, was, you know, it was a product of women kind of doing things in the kitchen and discovering. I mean, we have no idea. I mean, they had no, no notion of, of, you know, B vitamins and, and things like that. But for whatever reason, it caught on and, and became vital to the nutritional health of the people living really throughout the Americas. Okay. Um, one other thing I just want to touch on very briefly is the... Um, Another aspect of the Colombian Exchange is, of course, 
We t talked already a little bit about the slave trade, but the reason for the slave trade was, of course, sugar. Exactly, right? That it was the insatiable demand of Europeans for sweetness that caused, you know, more than 10 million Africans to be carried across the Atlantic uh, to work in those plantations to produce it. And, you know, you can sort of talk about how demand, on the one hand, by consumers in early modern Europe, then you know, sort of leads to the conditions of creating labor and industrial production and then distribution technologies to carry that sugar into the new world. And we could talk about slavery and all of its consequences, which of course is another one of those topics that certainly in a world history class and, and in many other classes as well, you simply can't ignore. Okay, so um, at this point, we've talked about food as a topic, food as a lens. Now, I just, in the little time that's left, I want to talk about uh, food as a, uh, as a material, right? How can you bring food into the classroom and why should you? And as I said, it's an active le learning tool, okay? Uh, there is something about the embodiment of food, right? The fact that you actually feel it, touch it, ingest it that words and writing on the chalkboard and how many PowerPoints, I could PowerPoint you till the end of the, of the millennium and it would not have the impact of a single bite of food. And so what I did was, I uh, actually the first thing I did to prepare this lecture uh, today, I arrived in town yesterday and I went down University Avenue to San Pablo and I went shopping because truly there is no better class planning tool than a grocery store. And here's what I found. Went to a place called Mi Tierra, and I found sugar. Biloncillo, exactly. It was called different things. I mean, there it was called biloncillo, but, but, but it could just as easily be panocho. Now, the problem is I hadn't anticipated just how big this class would be, but on the other hand, uh, the nice thing about sugar is that if you just find a little hammer or something, it's endlessly dividable. Um, and so we'll put this on the side here. Or maybe, can you find something? Or maybe I'll just. Yeah, actually, I, I, could, I could do that. The only problem, well, actually, what I'll do is um, kind of do it in my bag here. I could. Um, actually, I could just do it with it. Oh, Wouldn't excellent. Something, something flat underneath it here. Oh, yes. Flat perfect. <laughs> when I'm in classroom, I actually buy a, a sugar cane. I can get a big okay. stock in an Asian class. Wow. I bring it, and then I bring a machete. <laughs> and I <laughs> gets their attention. I'm always careful, though, to aim this way. <laughs> Don't want bad things to happen. Tough little boogers. <laughs> Guys, you know you need something bigger. <laughs> I need something bigger. Well, anyway, um, not having much luck here, but I'll just spread a little out. Oh! <laughs> and you fly. <laughs> I am so sorry. Right here. Oh, it's just the beginning of the food spread. This is why it's great that we're the last thing. Just think. All right, well, I tell you what, I'll just kind of <laughs> leave some here. <laughs> leave some here. <laughs> here we go. Okay. Leave some here. Grab some sugar. And then, let's see, I'll put some over here so that you folks can grab some as well. Help yourself. Okay. So I hope everybody, I hope everybody has gotten at least a little sugar. Yeah, that's it. 
Has everybody got a piece? You don't have, well, there, you can help yourself. There's some right there. There is more sugar here. Anyway, you don't have to eat it, but I will. What difference does it make in the classroom when you've actually got the sugar? It's hands on. Because there's curiosity. Like, apparently, I'm like, I have never seen this thing before. I want to put it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a visual aid, it's tutorial. I know because the kids have, they don't know what this is, and they're like, it can be powerful. And I, I'm not sure I would ever do this again because I share classroom, but um, I, I bring a Dorian into a classroom that's, that is like a multi ethnic classroom, and you will have the strongest lesson on the cultural basis for what you like and don't like. Yeah, on the other hand then, sort of bring like a stinky cheese into that same classroom yes. and see how the division goes exactly. that way. <laughs> yeah, so you, you really start to see things that are, I mean, just, just deeply, I mean, memorable, right? The, I mean, how often do you see your instructor sitting here pounding away on sugar trying to, <laughs> I mean, that in itself has got to be worth at least a little bit. This okay. That's a good question. What is this? Is this is this the same sugar that you put into your no. coffee or tea or whatever in the morning? No. no. This is actually a very different way of making sugar. Actually, this is not just brown sugar. I mean, the brown sugar you get today is now made by uh, basically they make white sugar, um, and then they add some molasses back to color it. And the reason for that is that the technology, they, they basically use giant centrifuges to make sugar. Now to, to and I mean sugar is, is it's, it's a grass. I mean it's, and you, in the, in the past you would squeeze the grass in these, these rollers. They had these giant rollers. They would look like this and they were attached to, you know, in the early days there would just be maybe a mule or donkey that would walk around and that would turn the rollers. And by the, the 17th century they had giant water wheels that were running them and they had three rollers. Anyway, so the slaves would then take the sugar cane and they would run it through the, the mills and it would just squeeze it and that the, the sap, the, the juice of the plant would pour out and, and, and that then would be purified because I mean you know it's, 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 it's sap it's got all these impurities in it and, and, and that would be then the uh, that, that would just dry out and, and crystallize and make sugar. Now the reason that the piloncillo looks like it's a conic section right okay it's got a little bit if anybody actually got a part that was still Here's, here's the piece, right? You can actually see that it's not, yeah. it's, it's, it curves in. And the reason for that is that they would dry them in little cones, and then at the bottom, the, the, the dark stuff would pour out. And, um, and so at the very top, there would be these white parts, and that would be the purest stuff, and that would get shipped back to Europe, to consumers. And then the dark stuff down here would be consumed locally, or they would make it into rum, or they would, um, you know, sort of do those kinds of things. And um, and, and 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 so anyway, those those cones then sort of uh, a way of showing that it's still that 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 old style of production. Okay, but incident, yeah. Oh, the, the darker stuff, the stuff down here, it's called bagas or, or uh, panocho. So, the, so the, the, the part at the top is the white, right? And then the part down below is the darker, that stuff, exactly, right? And, 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 and they produced a lot of it. it. It was not good, it was not the high quality stuff that would get exported, so it was consumed locally. And actually there was a whole lot of rum drinking on those, those Caribbean plantations. <laughs> uh, and who knows? Still is. <laughs> Where is turbinado sugar coming? Uh, you know, these are all just, I mean, there's a million names for brown sugar. So and, but yeah, I mean, that's just, yeah, and, and just sort of local, different local names. And the, 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 but it's the same thing. Okay. There's also, I, I wish I could project this picture. It's a picture that I took in um, Ho Chi Minh City, but there's all kinds of sugars like that. 
there was a, a place on the market that has those kinds of piloncillos. Piloncillos? But um, in all different colors, like there were orange ones, bright orange ones, red wow. ones, all sorts cool. of different productions. If anybody wants to see, like, yeah. I'll show you. Yeah. Could you spell the word? Ah, so piloncillo. Panocho. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of those. I mean, you know, just just uh, search for like different terms for sugar, and there are probably a million of them that will pop up. Yeah. How does beet sugar differ in a? Ah, beet sugar. Now. Chemically, sugar is, uh, and I, was anybody a science, science person to actually tell me what the chemical word for sugar is? There's, a, there's actually, a, a, I don't know, it's like. Different kinds, there's sucrose, glucose, fructose. Yes, exactly. But um, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, but I mean, that th these are, you know, and, and, and they, they can be extracted from many different things, right? They can be extracted from cane. They can be extracted from beets. Uh, they can be extracted from corn. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways of making sugar, right? And, and chemically, at some level, they're all the same. But what's curious is the ways that culturally people have sort of said that some sugars are better than others, right? So why is white sugar better than brown sugar? Except when the hippies come along and then brown sugar is, is better than white sugar. Well, they, I'm going to say as a They absolutely do. You're right. I don't think it's just, I mean, if, if your goal is one thing versus another, they're not, like beet sugar and cane sugar are not interchangeable for a lot of people. Well, but it depends on how it's been refined, because at some level you can get a chemically indistinguishable, you know, form of sucrose that, you know, you can get from... But you know, you're right. I mean, it, in in terms, in, in in actual terms, yes. But then, there, so there's this sort of what the baker might seem. But there's also a level at which sugar was about making race in America, um, you know. And there were darker sugars for darker people, right? So there's a wonderful book that's going to come out whenever it comes out. I read the manuscript, but. Um, you know, and, and, it, and it looked at how in colonies like Puerto Rico, the Philippines and whatnot, that, that these, these sugars were then sort of uh, seen as being, uh, well, there was one of, little, uh, of a little, uh, you know, Puerto Rican kid eating a, a sugar cane. And, and, and the, the label on it was, you'll excuse me, but picking any candy shop. Um, and, and that was one of the ways in which these were racialized. Right, and that you know. So if you're sitting around in a bourgeois household and you get one lump or two of pure white sugar, right? You know, that's a way of showing that you are a middle-class white, respectable family. Very different from the sugars that are being eaten by Mexican or Puerto Rican or uh, African American or I mean, there were Chinese sugars. There were all of these different sugars that were you know culturally appropriate. That was that was how they produced and traditionally consumed. Them, okay, but um, you know this is a very different one than perhaps the sugar that a lot of your students have been have 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 had access to, and so by you know sort of by 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 touching these things by sort of coming into contact with them, they they, they may be a memorable way of you know imparting some of these lessons. Uh, yeah. And I was just thinking about Ms. Elias in ninth grade. And we read this short story called Sweet Potato Pie, and then she brought in Sweet Potato Pie. Mm -hmm. And it was really important to us as little white Piedmont kids to have a different cultural experience, even though she also discussed stereotypes at the same time, so it was responsible. And then um, the other thing is I, I was thinking about making classroom communities. And I, you know, the idea of breaking bread with people and creating families, like even just the fact that you did this and this act of generosity of going and buying sugar, like it makes people feel more connected to each other. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, that the students form their own communities when they sit around together and, and you know, even if they don't exchange food, they just talk about food. And again, it's that food voice coming out and harnessing that as a teaching tool. One last thing I will just kind of point out. 
and to sort of visualize, and this is a graphic image that I always talk about with when I talk about the students, is that the slaves, when they would feed that sugar cane in there, they would be working 18 hours a day. You know, and they had to stop. They, they, they would run the mills 24 hours a day if they could, but they had to stop and clean it or it would get kind of gummed up. But, so they would be working very hard. They would basically, what their, their, their food was was sugar, right? So they're on this sugar rush all the time. And they would get sleepy, as anybody who works like that does. And so there were accidents where they would push too hard and they would get pulled through, which was very bad for the, it would, if the, these things, especially the, the, the water wheel powered ones, were actually powerful enough to pull an entire human body through the roller, which was terrible because it broke the roller. And then you'd shut down production for weeks on end, right at the height of the sugar thing. And so as, a, um, as, a, as an industrial precaution to, to, to maintain the, 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 the machinery, they would have, every mill would have a slave with a machete. And when an accident happened, they would cut the limb off to prevent more damage to the machinery. And so every plantation would have slaves with one arm off or both arms off. And that was a very graphic image of the human cost of this labor. So anyway, um, trying, to, <laughs> trying to get the, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of to bring history alive, right? And, 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 and there's really no better way of, of, of connecting it, you know, to the memory, right? To the, the, this, you know, I mean, Proust was right. I mean, neuroscientists have found that, 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 that food inscribes memories at a very deep level, right? That we, we remember the sugars and the, the, the sweet potato pies and all those other things, right? And, and so I think that adding it as part of, you know, whatever classes you teach, whether it's as a lens, as a topic, or, you know, as, as an active lear learning tool uh, can be a wonderful way of enhancing uh, your teaching. Um, now, we've still got a little more time uh, to answer questions, and I'll do that. But before, I've got a couple of other, I found some other stuff, too. And uh, so this is Pulparindo, which I've never actually seen before, but uh, it looked cool. And, and it's actually got, there are their 20 pieces, so they're surely one of each. And I got like the, uh, I think this is the mild one with just a little, tamarind and chili, and then this looks like the hot one with a lot of chili, so if, if you're the hot one, try that one. But it's a, it's a very interesting thing, because this is another example of that Colombian exchange, right? Because tamarind is a South Asian sour taste, and chile, of course, is an American uh, spicy taste. And so how do those two things come together and create this culturally specific flavor. Can I ask which kind of a shop you got this in? This is Mitiera. It's down on, it's a, it's a Mexican or Hispanic. I don't know. It's probably a pan, pan Latino kind of a thing. And so anyway, uh, there's, these are the hot ones. <laughs> and um, do you want to start handing those out to people? And then here are the, the mild ones. <laughs> Got some, some mild ones here. If anybody wants mild. Got some more of the mild here, okay. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Here you go. Another one. Uh, does anybody want the mild? Did you get? I yep. You want? There you go. Does anybody have an extra hot? Thank you. 
Did everybody get their... Okay, I'm going to bite into one of these bad boys and, uh, and then try to answer any questions you have. <laughs> yes? I have, a, I have a question. Um, I, uh, I'm kind of curious about, like, so we say food, and I say food to us means sustenance, and then like spice means something different, and drugs mean something different, and medicine means something different, right? Each of those. And I'm just sort of curious because it seems like the trade in different commodities over time doesn't, I think we're projecting those categories back in time because like the nutmeg trade to me looks like a drug trade, not a food trade. And I'm just curious about. Yeah, there's a wonderful book by uh, Paul Friedman called From Out of the East, and it's about um, spices in the medieval imagination. And basically what he does is the first chapter is about spice as a food. But then there's a chapter on spice as perfume. And then there's a chapter on spice as drug. And then there's a chapter on spice as moral failing. Right, you know, the priests who used too much spice were gluttons. Right, the, the pursuit of spice from out of the east. Paul Friedman. I use this in just the very basic undergraduate classes, and it's a, it's a really accessible book that, I mean, I don't know if high school students could, but I mean, I think good high school students could read that book and get a lot out of it. So yes, absolutely. And it's only in modern times that we have separated that out, right? And so, and you know, I mean, the nutrition, right? The, the whole nutritionism thing that Michael Pollan, among other people, has talked about, right, where we no longer think of foods as foods, we think of them as sources of, you know, protein and um, omega-3s and whatever else, you know, it is that we're trying to get to live forever. So, yeah, I mean, the very different notions of food that were, you know, kind of just... Because I think it's hard to explain the sugar trade as a food trade, but it's very easy. Uh, yeah, I just uh, came back from China, and uh, in China there's lines everywhere, of course, but as far as the lines for a restaurant, surprisingly, some of the longest lines are for McDonald's or Pizza Hut, and so you know, it has me stepping back thinking, uh, we talk about the Colombian exchange, uh, you know, a lot of times in, in a kind of positive light in how this trade took place, and uh, all the opportunities that were created and the foods that were exchanged. But we look at, again, this kind of make world globalization effect, often in a more negative light. I'm wondering, you know, just from your perspective, down the road, in the future, will we go back and look at this uh, in a more balanced uh, view, uh, this kind of globalization, especially industrialization of our, our food and especially fast food? Well, yeah, and in fact, that's what in Planet Taco, that's what I tried to do. But there's a wonderful book um, by uh, a man named um, James Watson called Golden Arches East. And basically, anthropologists went to Tokyo, Beijing, Hong Kong, Seoul, Taipei, and ate at McDonald's. And that was their research. And actually what they found out was that the Chinese weren't there to get Big Macs. They liked the fries, okay, but that the, they weren't so keen on the hamburgers. But what they were there for was not so much the food as the experience of being in America. It was a way of going on a tourism, to visiting America without actually leaving their home place. And so, you know, whenever we think about globalization, we have to remember that it's an active process by the people themselves, right? Just as corn didn't just take root in some places, it was a product of the social conditions around them. 
right? And there's no denying the fact that McDonald's is a giant corporation that he has huge advertising budgets and that, you know, I mean, Chinese consumerism is, I mean, run amok. Um, and yet, it becomes a form of Chinese consumerism or consumerism with Chinese characteristics as they always like to put it, right? And, and so, you know, and, and just like capitalism with Chinese characteristics, you know? And, and so uh, the global process is certainly, you know, happening and it's, it's changing things, but it's not necessarily the Americanization process that oftentimes we imagine it to be, right? We think McDonald's going everywhere and we imagine McDonald's being the same thing as it is in the United States. And you know, actually my favorite story on how, how different McDonald's can be is, it, I mean, basically in the United States, kind of a lower class sort of thing, right? Although that's actually a recent phenomenon because when, when um, Ray Kroc was getting started, he was aiming for a middle class audience. And it was actually took decades of work by civil rights activists like Jesse Jackson to actually get McDonald's in black communities. And you know, so when we tell black kids you shouldn't be eating this, it was like, hey, we fought for decades to get it, and now you tell us it's bad for us? <laughs> but never mind that. Um, but the, the point here is that when you go to other societies, it's very much a middle class phenomenon. And so for example, in Rio de Janeiro, and I don't know if this is still true, but you could order, along with your Big Mac, Dom Perignon. Is that good? I don't know, but it's certainly different. 